know what you know about music in um, in kind of college environment while you're dealing with all the other things. So uh, I want to have a panel of uh, five people here. I want them to um, let's start by I think each of you introduce yourself, uh, your background, uh, just briefly at university and what what you're involved in music-wise on campus. <coughs> Go. Okay. Hi. Uh, my name is Raga. I am not a student anymore, but you were involved. I uh, I went to the University of Michigan, where we had an organization called Sahana, very um, which was a um, Indian gen general Indian classical music and dance organization. already introduced me. I'm Srihari. I currently go to the University of Michigan. Um, and yeah, so we were both a part of uh, Michigan Sahana, which like you said, is, uh, um, <clears throat> it was actually one of the, the people that kind of started it and made it kind of big was Sanji over there, because he also went to the University of Michigan. Um, so the group, just a, a little bit of a background for the group, I guess. Are we doing that? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Is um, so it's it's for all things like Indian classical music and dance. So that includes like Carnatic music, Hindustani music, and like a bunch of different styles of dance. And so uh, we have a very like uh, big group of people, and it's like all skill levels. So really, anyone that wants to join can join. Um, and we try to hold events that can include as many people as possible. Um, and we try to do cool things where you can kind of learn about different styles while you're there. Um, and you know, still keep in touch with your own traditional roots while you're at it. And so it's a, it's a cool experience, I guess. We'll, we'll be talking more about it. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kapil Ramnarayanan. I'm currently a, well, I'm going, about to be a sophomore at UNC Chapel Hill um, in North Carolina. I am a biomedical engineering and music double major. Uh, so this music, of course, is I'm, I play uh, Western violin. Um, but at the same time, there's a lot of things that with continuing music in college, it's given me a lot of opportunities to continue Karnatic music as well. Um, just, just right off the bat, I list a few, like I can get free access to practice rooms, I can get free lockers, um, I, I get like, uh, I can even take uh, lessons, I can take Skype classes for Mrilangam uh, in the practice rooms. And so being a music major has, and just continuing music has actually helped both Western music and Karnatic music, and so we can talk about that more later on, but yeah, nice to meet you. Hey everyone, I'm Ashwin. Uh, I'm currently a rising junior at UC Berkeley. Uh, so as part of what organizations I'm part of, um, I'm part of two uh, organizations that deal with music. One is Laya Berkeley that you all just saw um, a couple of hours ago. So basically what we do is that's more of a fusion group. So there are a lot of Indian classical artists like Carnatic and Hindustani, um, but we do have like a few Western uh, artists too. So it's cool, I guess, um, because everyone has very diverse backgrounds, right? So it's cool seeing what everyone has to offer, what you can learn from them, and how you can, I guess, create something that can be really cool, like combining all of these ideas. Um, the second group that I'm part of, actually with Vishnu, is the a cappella group. Uh, we're a South Asian a cappella group. And even though um, we don't necessarily focus a lot on Carnatic music, a lot of us are trained in Carnatic music before. So it's really cool. We all bond over that, I guess. So um, yeah. So my name is Vishnu. Um, from the area here, but um, as Ashwin mentioned, I'm also from Berkeley, and um, the main main way, the main musical group I was part of was um, Vilse, which is um, the South Asian acapella group there. Um, but prior to that, I learned Carnatic music for, or I'm still learning Carnatic music since the age of four, so it's uh, still a big part of my life as well. So, yeah. Um, and if you don't know me, I'm Sanjeev. If you don't know me, that's an issue by now. Do you need a chair? <laughs> no, I don't need a chair. <laughs> this is fun. Um, 
So I guess let me give you my background when it comes to university groups and the reason this topic is so personal for me. Um, so I was, as they said, uh, in Michigan uh, undergrad, I was the music chair for Sahana, the group there, uh, before Raghav and before she and, um, and then you know, we had uh, at Sahana a big group, uh, music, uh, both Carnatic and Hindustani, Bhatanatyam, Kuchipudi, like all the classical dance forms and music forms. It was in one group in Michigan. And once I went to, uh, I did my master's at Georgia Tech, and there I, I'm running the group called Arohi, uh, which is the uh, same thing, Carnatic and Hindustani, just the music side uh, of the group. So you know, I also will touch on a lot of the work that I had done is kind of on the organizing end too, right? That's where I picked up a lot of the uh, things I know about you know, audio systems or getting people together and putting putting concert groups together. Um, and so there's an organizing component of university groups, there's a performance, there's, uh, um, you know, how do you invite people. So we're going to touch on some of those topics and at any time, probably I'll let them talk for maybe 10 minutes and then at any time, if you have any questions, just interrupt. This is meant to be fairly casual, right? So I guess let's uh, talk about um, I want to talk about, so the big, big topic that a lot of people said they had in mind is um, time management. Uh, how do you manage your time, both as a student, right? You've got classes, and when you're in college, you have to manage your own schedule. Nobody tells you when to eat, nobody tells you when to, <laughs> you know, you have to manage those things. So how do you make time for music, um, and what are the kind of things you do, um, despite having a busy schedule in academics and um, studying as well? Uh, okay, so I, I guess I'll go first. Um, so for me, I because like I said, so I was a music major, or I am a music major, and so um, with that I can get practice rooms and I can get a locker where I can keep my mridangam right next to the practice rooms, and so that actually helped a lot more with just the logistics of practicing, because in between classes, if I'm nearby and I have an hour then I can go there and I can immediately practice and then just I can use up that hour which before if I had an hour between classes I would just kind of sit around in the library and and I'd say I was studying but like you're on YouTube yeah, yeah, yeah. you understand is there any interruption when, uh, when you do your practice by other kind of students like uh, uh, other Americans not. or uh, other um, people well Generally, um, especially with just sort of practice room etiquette, if, if you don't know the, the, the people, generally they won't stop you. But definitely there are times when someone's practicing next to you and they're playing like the drum set and they're playing extremely loud and it kind of drowns you out. And those are definitely things that you'll have to deal with and they're, they're unavoidable. But as far as like respecting um, like your time that you have to practice. No, there's not many interruptions. As they, as well. they don't ask you questions. They will ask you questions, um, especially after. No, like like they'll ask maybe after you're done. So if you leave and then they notice that you were practicing, they'll ask, what is that instrument? They're always, um, and especially all the professors, uh, they'll see me with the mridangam, and then a lot of them, in fact, know what the mridangam is, and they're familiar with Carnatic music, and then they'll ask, and then, um, they might give you opportunities to, to showcase small small bits in their classes, and so generally in college in college environments, people are very accepting and people are very respectful of different cultures. So, yeah, um, going off of that, uh, so uh, at Berkeley, so because we're not um, music majors, like. Uh, usually for the practice rooms it's like a little harder to get like access so you usually have to pay like a $20 fee to use them for the semester um, so usually I procrastinate a lot with that and I'm like oh I'll pay my $20 and then practice and never pay until like a month into the semester um, I guess uh, college is definitely very busy um, but like uh, Kapil said, like between classes, or if you just have an 8 a.m. and then you have like a lot of time in between, like that's the best time to like practice. I, I don't know, usually for me. 
Um, I guess another really cool thing is at Berkeley at least there's a lot of other Carnatic people so if you just walk into the practice room like you'll probably like hear someone singing like something classical like one time I walked in and I just saw Vishnu like practicing and I was like oh how nice like um, so uh, it's just like um, I don't know it really motivates you a lot to see that like so many other people um, are also doing like the same art form as you, I guess. It motivates you a lot, I guess, to like get into the habit of practicing. Yeah, I mean, uh, so yeah, for, for us too, I mean, I'm, I'm not a music major or anything like that. And really, I actually like, I haven't really practiced in a like practice room on campus in, in forever. We usually like, we'll go, the times when I practice is like after like classes are done maybe at like six or seven, there will be a lot of empty classrooms in a building. And there's one building that's like famous for all your different music groups on campus, like any style and stuff, and they'll all kind of practice on different rooms there. And so we'll kind of, it's called the Mason Hall, if anyone's from Michigan, they, you'll definitely know that. Um, and so you just kind of go on any floor and randomly try opening doors. And if you get lucky, one of them's unlocked. And uh, um, we've actually gotten pretty good at like sneaking cards into the door and, and unlocking them even if they are locked. So, so uh, you know, we kind of you know, break into these rooms and, and practice. And if you, uh, you know, a lot of times I'll just either like text Rod over anyone else on campus that's free at the time and then just see if they're, they're down to practice and then we'll go and do it. Uh, Is there any possibility of uh, practicing in, in the open auditorium or something like that? Uh, so usually like the auditoriums and stuff are are more you kind of have to like book those to practice or something like that or, or there are always like shows and stuff going on there um, so like we usually do like the rooms and then if we like put on shows or something we'll actually book the auditorium and perform there. yeah so I mean as you see right a lot of the responses that they gave is all uh, are about university resources when you're on a campus you know, you have to think about, okay, where can I go practice? Because if you're in a dorm, you can't necessarily practice with so many people around. So where can I go practice? When is that available? When am I available? Right? I may have class here and here and here in five different buildings. So how do I create the time to, you know, go and practice? I, for me, you know, I always carried a shooting box in my backpack because I didn't know, like, where I would be taking class that evening, which dorm I would find a, for a Skype class. So. I would always, um, you know, yeah, you keep a shooting box with you. You, you, you have some options, and I'd go sit there like half an hour before I had to log in, uh, just to make sure the room was available. So you have to work a lot with the university uh, and facilities like that. Um, so I kind of want to switch topics. Uh, you know, seeing as we have a bunch of students here, um, and I get them to understand how you have grown musically since you went to college, right? Uh, and I think I'll give you my example. Um, going into college, I knew nothing about, I was mostly, you know, I know Carnatic, I didn't know Hindustani, I didn't know any other forms. Um, and I, I, going into Sahana, the, you know, my first year, it was mostly a Hindustani group. They sang Kavali, they sang, kind of, you know, Urdu uh, music or some other uh, type of music. And that, I had no exposure to that. So I, you know, I picked up on that, I learned some of that. Uh, and you, you learn a lot of things from people that don't, are not necessarily Carnatic people. Um, so in the same way, how did you learn musically from the people around you? And especially, you know, you're a music major, you're gonna pick up a lot from people around you. So what are some of those learnings um, that you picked up over time that were not necessarily what you thought? Um, see, you know, mo most of you would be familiar with how big events like these youth festivals, where you get to meet other people uh, who play music and are interested, that kind of motivates you to learn and practice. In the same way, meeting a lot of people who do music and different kinds of music at a university is a similar motivating factor. So one, there's meeting other people who do Carnatic music um, that helps you learn about that. But then I got to interact with Hindustani musicians and other like, folk musicians, um, uh, people a lot more dancers than I had in the past too, and I ended up doing performances with dancers, not just Bharatanatyam dancers, but Odissi dancers and Kuchipudi dancers. And uh, being around those people, I think, gives you a couple things. Uh, one of them is you know, learning to perform with them. You 
uh, kind of learn the similarities in the musical language um, and how, how they're different. And when you talk to someone about what Carnatic music is and what you want to, or how you want to get them to understand what you do, uh, it, it, you learn, it's like any, anything where you learn a lot when you learn how to teach it. Um, and you're not necessarily teaching the music, but um, you're learning that language. So that was one thing that I, I, I gained a lot out of. Um, yeah. What is the possibility of learning some, some other music, like uh, Chinese music, Japanese music, or something like that? I think it's a possibility depending on where you go to university. Um, you know, in the context of this conversation, I think uh, you know we're, we're referring to just my, the experience that you have with other Indian classical musicians. But you find all kinds of musicians, especially with larger universities, um, that you can have similar conversations with. Um, I think where you come into, you know, when you say Chinese and Japanese music, you come uh, when you do performances at universities. They have a you know a multicultural night or some Asian art festival or whatever, and they say, "Can you sing a Carnatic song?" You're going to be in there with people that are doing K-pop and people that are doing other Asian music things, right? And so you have to know what is appropriate. Okay, this audience is not a Carnatic audience. I need to sing something fast, or I need to sing something something easy for the audience to understand. And so that's where you interact with these kind of music things. So you know the flow. Uh, between what you're doing and what the event is that you're doing. But if you're in a music school, and you may be able to say this, they may be able to understand a little more nuanced things in Carnatic music, and you may be able to sing something heavier and something more um, something more relevant to them, right? Yeah, so in if you have even just a department of music, generally there will be a lot of professors who have studied Carnatic music, or at least have listened to many Kateris, and I think along the lines of learning different kinds of music, there are many groups, especially in UNC, where you can, if you are willing, and you can approach them, and then their professors and their advisors will be more than happy to, to accommodate you. Maybe it's a jazz group. I know this is one big thing that I've, I've been looking to do, is that Carnatic music and jazz have a, a ton of similarities. And so, just the improvisation aspect. And so, something like that, you can, if, if you ask, if you approach a jazz musician, then you say, I, I learned Carnatic music, most likely they'll know, they'll know what Carnatic music is. And then you say, I'd like to do some collaboration. And through that, you can learn jazz music as well. So, That's the reason why I ask you this question. Suppose we have somebody like Chinese uh, Russian music people, mm -hmm. you can have a fusion program with the yes. Carnatic music. Yeah, and there, there are groups that are specifically derived or that are spe uh, specifically made to feature Asian music. Um, like so, if if they have some some they had Japanese instrument um, showcases actually just before the semester ended in UNC and. And some um, Carnatic music musicians that I knew actually went there and featured Carnatic music and and the the styles and just the instruments. And so it was like a mutual exchange where we learned about exactly. Japanese instruments and they learned about Carnatic instruments. Yeah. And so yeah, in college, that's sort of the thing is that you can experiment, and that like if you want to do it, you can do it. So you saw this morning. Do you all remember this morning, right? The Berkeley performance. Remember, so Vikram had, they had the first part with the guitar, right, and then what kind of music they did then. And then when he switched to violin, the, the same group, you know, doing both a Carnatic style and a little more fusion style, uh, mixing other cinema elements or mixing Western elements or jazz elements, like he's saying. Um, and so, in I think you guys were telling me earlier, you guys have groups, subgroups, to address each of these, so that the same people, can, you can do Carnatic in one location that makes sense. You can do uh, kind of a collaboration that makes sense with Fusion. Can you talk about that a little bit, the subgroups within your group? For sure. Uh, yeah, so every semester what our group does is that we basically divide everyone up into subgroups based on what their interests are in. Or if it's like, if they want to do something that's pure Carnatic, or if other one, people want to learn about Carnatic music, um, I'll give you an example. So my first semester in Laya, I was in a Carnatic Hindustani kind of group, which was kind of a Jugal Bandi. Um, 
And we basically sang um, the song Jago Mohana, uh, which is in Hindi with Meru Samana. Both are in Maya Maragola or Bhaira. Um So that was really cool for me because here you get to like see what kind of music like Hindustani music is and you actually get to interact with people that are very experienced and professional in it, right? So um, I think having a very diverse group like that is really helpful and usually for subgroups we rotate every semester so you do a different genre um, every semester. So that way you're not only uh, you can not only like experience like the different genres, but you can also get to know everybody in the club because um, the club can be like really big, right? Some people uh, you won't get to hear them sing or like their ideas sometimes. So the subgroups really allows you one at a time, like one on one, to like learn from each other and create something that is that can be really cool together. You know. Um, so for me, I guess it was a bit more informal as to how how, when I was in an acapella group, how we split up. There are plenty of people with all sorts of backgrounds, Western, Hindustani, and Carnatic. Um, I kind of view music very much like, sort of in the, the same way we have Carnatic music, Hindustani music, and Western music, and Russian, Japanese, anything, right? It's just sort of like, sort of majors in college, right? I major in Carnatic music. But, uh, some, just like somebody, if somebody uh, majors in chemistry, or majors in, I don't know, and pick what have you, business, they're not gonna just know business, right? You can't just go into the world and just know your own subject. You're gonna have to be willing to learn um, other things as well, right? And how to how to incorporate that. So now, like in, in the world today, we have intersections of various different fields and people know more than one thing. And they're very versatile, right? <coughs> that same logic can be applied to music as well. Um, early on, we always like Carnatic uh, uh, music can be practiced in this, you know, in the subcontinent of India, and we always in these the towns, and we have these concerts being held locally, right? But now we have to sort of be able to bridge bridge these gaps between, say, Carnatic, Western, and um, especially Hindustani, and that's what college gives us this media, uh, this medium for, right? Um, a way to make uh, th this kind of communication, this open communication between genres possible so that we can all gain a more holistic view of what music is. It's not like our music is the only legitimate music. We can learn from other, well, we can learn from other uh, people as well. And I think that for me, especially being a part of an acapella group, um, you have these various different ideas Hindustani music, you know, is mostly known for we we have our styles of like gamakam and like Arati Bharna and like that kind of stuff, right? But Hindustani is very light and very straightforward music, uh, it's very kind of more soothing, not rough on the ear sometimes, and that can also be incorporated. And uh, Western music, their concept of chords, right? That these are just some small concepts that I've learned personally um, through various uh, to pr through practicing with all these people and so I think just op be having an open mind to all of these ideas. Um, college gives you that medium and they will always give you those resources but um, if, you're, if you have an open mind your, your musical experience will be enhanced. Um, I think if I can just add on to that. Uh, wh what's nice is, is having the option to do those things. So it's not that like you necessarily have to go out and, and do something like that. It's it's you get to do whatever you want to do. So you can go as far as you want with your with your collaborations, work with these people and you know some days you just want to sing a Dodi or Vita right? And that's hard to collaborate with someone else. So you just kind of go ahead and do it, right? It's it's hard to incorporate other styles. And then some days you you know you really want to get with them so you can pull out like a Sindhu or Bahad or something. So it's it's nice to have your your options here and there. Right, and that's the thing. When you're on campus, you are next to so many people um, in similar interests, music, you, you know, you don't have to drive an hour to meet your friends. Everybody is right there on campus, right? So that makes a big difference and you're going to meet these people more often, you're going to do music more often. Uh, and so everybody is going to come in with a different background. You don't know who the people that are going to be there every year. Every year new people are coming in, every year people are graduating. So you have different perspectives that you can um, you can work together with and you can collaborate as much as you want you can be uh, you know extremely um, 
as I said, Carnatic or in other styles to um, collaborate as you want. So I want to, I want each of you to quickly. So, how many of you, for a second, how many of you are high school? Okay. And <laughs> you're not in high school. Nice try. <laughs> so I want each of you quickly to, um, and seeing the high schoolers here, give them one thing or a couple things that they can look forward to in college on how they can take their music further. Let's, let's do it like this. Let's say one thing that high schoolers should take and one thing that parents should know about what happens in campus in terms of music. In terms of music. <laughs> other, thing, other things I'm not responsible for. <laughs> Um, we can either do a round of high school and a round of parents, or we can do one on one. Up to you. <laughs> so, at least on the for people going to college, um, I think one thing one thing that's helpful for me is you being you, you have to find a balance between being flexible with your with your time and how you prioritize practicing. And, Things like that. Sometimes you have to you have to plan in advance. There are logistics involved with having your instruments or having a place to practice. Um, and so there are so many times when Srihari and I have practiced at one, two in the morning in an empty classroom on a Wednesday night when it's there's two feet of snow outside and I'm trudging around with umbrella. I mean, you don't do those kind of things when you're not in college. Um, so having that flexibility, but also it, it is very easy to to get sucked into class and all the other academic things that are going on. So you know, having some structure, whether that's through joining a student organization or just making your own structure somehow with other people that you meet, um, helps you keep keep moving forward. Can we jump to Ashwin quickly? Because he has to leave. So. Oh, um, that's OK. <laughs> you have a sure. drink again. Yeah. yeah. Um, first of all, I guess good luck to all of you guys going to college next year. Um, so I guess another thing is that when you go to college, you meet a lot of people with different music backgrounds, right? Uh, Western, Hindustani, um, and that's really cool, right? But like Sri Hari said, sometimes you just want to sing a Thori or Bhairavi, um, just out of the blue, right? Um, and I guess it depends on what type of musician you are and you want to be going forward. Um, but I guess if you want to stick to like Carnatic music, like it's I guess it's important to like remember to like stick to your roots like what your I don't know for me at least like uh, sometimes it's easy getting confused with like different styles I guess um, does that make sense um, yeah so I guess um, I guess just like once in a while just sitting down and singing your thori or bhairavi or just something that helps you stay connected, I guess, with um, Carnatic music, like what you learned in the first place, I guess, is that's something that's been like really helpful for me, I think. Um, and definitely, uh, that's something I wish I knew before going into college, too. Yeah, I guess uh, another big thing, kind of something to look forward to, I guess the big theme that we've been talking here is like meeting new people. And, and really, I can tell you that like, I, I went to school 40 minutes from my college, and the people that I, that I spend time with in college are not the same people I spend time with in high school. They're, you know, I, obviously I do hang out with some high school friends, but there's just a whole, it's, it's a huge network of people that you get a chance to meet. And, and be with on, on campus. And so that is something that you really should look forward to and make sure that you take advantage of that. It's, it's important to you know, kind of branch out and try to meet as many you know, types of people as you can, decide you know, like who you want to hang out with, what you want to do, things like that. That's, that's, a, that's a real important thing to have. I guess to parents, um, yeah, I'll just address this, uh, but um, if, we all have this enthusiasm for music, right? We're all gathered here, and that's uh, that's not because, at least hopefully at this stage, it's not because you told your kid to do something, right? Or uh, I know um, sometimes there's like amma uh, nappa when when I was young, they're like practice pani neya ni ni ke pani neya. They they'll always ask that question, right? But at this point, if, if when your ki when your kid goes to college, right? When you guys go to college, 
it will, you'll always find time if you find music vital to your life, um, no matter what. And like whether that's having practice sessions at one or two, like that's as if like I'm doing homework at one or two, right? Like if you if you can draw these parallels at how how much we value music, and so. Um, don't stress about um, whether or not we'll keep up music. It'll happen organically because it's so ingrained in us. And that's why we're gathered here today, because we appreciate that style, right? So you don't have to worry, and there are like-minded people in college as well. So the bottom line is you don't have to worry about um, whether or not like uh, we'll continue music in some, in some shape or form. Uh, we'll, like, I think, at this point, that's a, it's kind of a foregone conclusion that we will. Yeah, so I just wanted to quickly touch on something for high schoolers. Um, so I, I sort of wanted to touch on something that Agav said, is that it's easy to get sucked into the classes. So, like, because it's easy to study. Studying is just kind of like you make your index cards, and then you study it, and then you memorize it, and then you go. And it's, it's I mean, you shouldn't just memorize, you should, you should really make an effort to learn, but it's a lot easier, it's, it's less... Yeah, but it's... <laughs> but it's a lot easier, it's different with, with music, because with studying, it's just sort of like, you have to do it, but in ways, it's easy. It's, it's easy because you know what you have to do, you know what you're searching for, you're searching, you're lo you know what you're, you're working towards. You have a test tomorrow, and you have to study, it's like 12 in the morning, and, and you, you're studying, and then you know that that's your goal. But with music, it's just like this rocky road ahead of you. And um, I think one, like the biggest thing is you have to be able to find the drive within yourself. Um, I remember uh, uh, um, Shivaraman sir, I, when I met him one time, he told me, because a lot of people will tell me, oh, you're gonna do biomedical engineering as your job and music as a hobby. And that's not completely correct because music isn't just a hobby. It isn't just something you kind of you pick up, like like you said, like Vishnu said. It's it's ingrained in you, especially after you've done it for so long. You're doing it through high school. You stuck with it because high school was also hard, and you're still doing music. And so you have that passion within you. And so music isn't a hobby anymore. It's a passion. And with that passion, you need to be passionate. You need to have that drive. You need to say, okay, I have this hour. I could listen to YouTube, or I could go practice. And that's just one thing you have to find within yourself. And parents, I know like sometimes you still see your kids as your little babies, and you have to like baby them. And if oh, have you practiced yet? Oh, and, but like I think I think one thing to tell parents is that give them the freedom and just trust them that if they've stuck with it this long, they're not really doing it just for you. They have to be doing it for themselves. And so if you let them naturally, organically go and find that passion within themselves, then they'll flourish even more than in high school when you were behind them telling them, oh, practice, practice, you, you only practice 30 minutes today, or something like that. And so I think that that's sort of the thing is that the high schoolers have to find the drive and the parents have to let them find the drive. Okay, since we have less than 10 minutes, um, I do want to um, open it up basically to questions first from the uh, students, from participants and young people. So any questions that you guys have for any of these people, right? About what kind of things could you do or, you know, I'm, I'm learning this, like how do I continue uh, certain things in college? Anyone? Yeah? Uh, how do you have the drive to practice if you don't have a performance? That is, actually, that is a very, that is a very good um, observation. Repeat the, repeat the question. Huh? Repeat the question. Oh, okay, yeah, so he asked, how do you have the drive if maybe you don't have a performance coming up? And to that, I just have to say, you, you have to you have to think of it like that is actually a very good question so like the thing is is when when you have the drive you have to have you still have to set goals for yourself so you still have to have some sort of assessment maybe if you if you want to work on I don't know Kanaka or something like that and you want to say that so if you don't have any performances you can take that as an opportunity to work on something that you wouldn't be able to work on if you just if you're just working towards a towards a performance, and so if say like um, with performances as a Mridangam uh, artist, if I um, 
if I'm not like listening to a specific song or I'm not performing practicing a specific thani, then I can explore what I can do. I can just listen to kacheris and see, okay, I have this kacheri. Let me try playing towards this. Let me try making a thani for this. Maybe purutam korve, something like that. So setting those goals for yourself. Setting like your personal assessments. So I actually, um, you know, uh, I actually think it's more fun to practice when you don't have a concert or anything coming up. Because uh, when, when you do have a performance or something like, next week, then that's just on the back of your mind whenever you sit down and practice, right? Whether you are actively practicing for that performance or not, it's always there, oh yeah, I have to sing this next week. But if you don't have anything coming up, you're totally free. So when you when you get the chance to sit down and practice, you can practice anything you want. Whatever you feel like that day is what's going to happen, right? So that's, um, so just having that feeling, I, I think, is, is the best, is when you can just you know, call someone and be like, hey, let's just practice. Yeah, like that's sort of going over like the, the freedom you have in college. I think part of that too is uh, having someone else to call. That, that helps a lot. Because when you're sitting and practicing by yourself, you know, there's a lot you can do and you can have that motivation, but I think that's doubled when I have someone that I can say, hey, I want to practice this next week uh, with you. Can we do that? You know, if you have someone who lives two minutes away from you, then that next week, for that next week, you're going to be doing that every day because that's going to be on your mind. So that's kind of a, another way of goal setting that has a different kind of outcome. It has, um, if, if you don't do it, then you'll, you know, the next week practice with that person is not going to be as fun. So you want to do it. Um, so it's, it's making, making goals and also making it a lot more fun for yourself along the way by trying new things. Oh yeah, so um, I know in high school it's pretty hard for like students to get, or like Karnatic music students to get involved with like organizing and planning concerts, so how has your involvement within the campus, um, within like student run groups, help um, with event planning and help that get you more involved with Karnatic music? Um, so <laughs> I promise Thanks. I did not plan this question. <laughs> so. Uh, so um, last year I was uh, I was on board for for Sahana. I was concert chair, and what that entails is like all the audio setup and, and planning, like uh, a booking a venue, things like that for a concert. And I can guarantee you, I, I had never seen a mixer in my life before I actually became before I was in that role. So I had no idea what I was doing, and I was just thrown into it, and it was the greatest thing ever because I learned how to you know hook up a whole audio system. And then you just kind of go through the process of, of booking a venue, talking with different people, because we put on shows through the year. And so you'd email different people to try to get the best venue possible on what date you can, and organizing the show, making sure all the groups show up. And so uh, being like actively involved like that, and you don't have to be like a, on the board or anything like that. If you're just any you know, normal person that wants to get involved in that, if you ask, there's always stuff to do. Um, for these organizations, because they're always like, you know, on demand or whatever, right? So they'll always have something for you to do, and it's, it's a great place to start. Um, this is less so for my college organizations, but um, some of you may know uh, North Carolina Youth Classical Arts for Charity, that's NCYCAC. It's a North Carolina group that was started by Sudarshan Mohan. He was here somewhere, I think he was roaming around, but, um, but um, it's that that's the like the the reason he started it is one to spread music and with youth two to raise money for charity and three is to give opportunities for youth to learn how to organize events how to plan events and and like to make those like mistakes when you're a kid because that's when you have to make mistakes because once you become an adult and you start planning larger things you're planning meetings in your job or something like that then you have to be able to know all the details that go into it, and if you make a mistake, there's there's larger consequences. And so I think, like, as far as what what organizations, student-run organizations, do to help that planning is this to provide a platform where you can try, like you can just try to do something. If you notice, right, none of us did anything by ourselves in college. It was <clears throat> we had a framework called Sahana in Michigan. You know, they had NCYCAC and, you know, the things he was doing at UNC. And they have two groups at Berkeley. So you have these groups that are there by the people who have been there before you. They know what works on that campus. They know they have the resources. Okay, this is the auditorium we need. This is the sound we need. These are the people we have. So these groups are there for you to go and 
you know, contribute and improve that group, right? Take it to where you want that group to be uh, so that you can get the most out of it and also interact with other people. So before we end, I also do, I want to um, open it up to the parents as well. Questions from the parents on campus music groups, uh, Carnatic music on campus, and um, anything you want to know. You're not a parent, but yeah. So the question is, if your university doesn't have a group, like we have a lot of music people, you have a lot of music people, but you don't have a group. How would you? How do you start it, or how do you? You start it small. A lot of groups have start started in dorm rooms. Oh. It's just three people. They're like, okay, I'm going to meet at one a.m. <laughs> because uh, I was doing homework and didn't pay attention. So they meet at one a.m. in a dorm room, you know, and then they start a, uh, they practice for a while, and then okay, people hear about it, they join. And you can have a group, you know, my group in Georgia Tech is much smaller than the group we had in Michigan. So that's the kind of group where you meet, maybe you meet once in a while, once a month, because people don't have as much time, it's not a once a week activity. And so you, you slowly build it up, then you charter, the big step is really to charter an organization and have it going on an ongoing basis, so that you have board members, and you have people, and you can have a board, you know, a three person board, it doesn't have to be seven or eight people. So you start like that, start an apartment, uh, and, and then you grow, grow from there as your group gets more well known. And you can include people from the community as well. Say it again. You need to find a sponsor. Too. Yeah, sometimes you need to find a faculty sponsor. Uh, a lot of a uh, lot, lot of the um, universities have you know professors that are willing to help you help you with that. Um, and yeah, wherever you are, don't mistake the local community. The local community outside the university will be able to support you as well. Uh, particularly, we know for in Michigan for us, there's a huge uh, support uh, of having uh, some of the groups uh, that are there in the local area. Okay, um, we're almost we're out of time basically, but yeah. parents. It's okay. Yeah. So I would like to thank all of you. You know, you did a great job in taking the music as a passion and working hard in, in college and campus. That's really a great appreciation of support from all your uh, you guys. So one question is. Um, have you faced any harassment or anything uh, in the uh, college campus by non-music people? Um, or if, if you face so, then how would you help with that? The question is, have you faced any harassment or um, negative hostility negativity, yeah, yeah. from negativity from non-music people? And I have to say, I've never, I've never ever felt that. Because um, even if I'm practicing mridangam and i mean mridangam is not a it's not a quiet instrument it will it will shake the floor and if there's people nearby or something like they'll definitely notice but i've never had anyone come up to me and say like stop practicing or anything like that if anything they're always just very interested because i mean that's sort of like everyone's they they became accepting and personally i've i've never face something like that, but something like that may happen. And if that does happen, I think just being confident that this is your passion, this is what you want to do. And yeah, so I think that's that's the best way is just to say, I'm going to do this. And even if you show this negativity, even if you try to show this hostility, I'm not going to stop. Yeah, I've, I've never felt anything like that either. Yeah, I mean, there's one thing where just being conscious of where you're practicing yeah. to not disturb people. I mean, to an extent, it's you know, when you're when you're singing or something. It's not gonna. I mean, that's with any music. You're not gonna go practice in a quiet library. But, you know, if people tell you that it's it's very disruptive in a space, then that, then they'll tell you. But no harassment of any kind. So you should always respect kind of the local. You know, everybody else in the university, what they, their interests are and what they're doing, and the spaces that they work in, right? Um, okay, so then we're out of time. So let's just do 15 second. You know, what what is what, what is the message you want to uh, kind of communicate to everybody? 15 seconds. Go. Uh, uh, enjoy. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, that's it. <laughs>
I don't know, I guess just like, yeah, have fun with the music. Don't like, again, you don't have to think of it as a, as a big thing, you know, it's, it's something fun. You want to do it, do it, you know, that's it. Actually, I do have one thing. Now that I have 15 seconds to think. Um, the last thing though. You get a 15. Oh, perfect. Um, there, there's a lot of, we talked a lot about meeting new people on campus and the opportunities that are available with groups and other people. But that doesn't mean you should get sucked into the college and forget about everything else. So, um, I mean, it's easy, I, find, I figure I think it's easy to do that too. I mean, still go to Cleveland, and, you know, if you're if you have other contacts and other things outside of the university, don't forget about those and still do those things because sometimes you just want to stay on campus and you're, and you're stuck on campus. So. Yeah. So my thing is just take the step from it being something you practice at home with. I'm uh, telling you, hey, practice. And take the step to being, this is what I do, this is my passion, I'm going to do it of my own accord. And if there's other people that, who are like-minded and also share music as a passion, I'm going to share with them and collaborate with them. And I'm gonna try something new. I guess for me, uh, to summarize, I guess what happens in any facet of life, where there's a will, there's a way. So, um, yeah, and we all have the passion, so. Yeah, that's, it'll manifest itself in some shape or form. And I have two things. Wait. <laughs> I have two things. One, learn all the skills you can in college. Everything I learned about audio, everything I learned about concert organizing and putting a schedule together is because of what I did in undergrad. And being in the organization uh, and being in a group that encourages that that's where you're gonna learn a lot of the skills. You'll learn some here, you'll learn some in school, you'll learn some other places, but really college is a time that you're gonna have the opportunity and the skills and the people that are next to you to learn a lot of those things. And lastly, I think the big, the overarching point that, that some of you had mentioned is that music is for life. Music is, doesn't end when you have an angetra, or music doesn't end when you're in 11th grade, right? Music, music is forever, and you will continually learn um, you know, throughout your life, and college is going to be a big part of that. Um, and you're going to learn not only in what, uh, on top of what you know, but then things that you don't know, and you're going to diversify into other and respect other types of music as well. So I think with that we'll end it. If you have, obviously you know these people. So if you have any questions, you know, approach them, talk to them about what um, you know, what they, what else they do on campus, and. Get to know uh, what they do and come up with ideas on what you can do, uh, kind of as you go graduate high school and go into college and beyond. Thank you. Right?